required and do hereby sentence you to the New Hampshire State Prison for Women for the remainder of your life without the possibility of parole. The story of Pamela Smart unfolded in the small town of Derry, New Hampshire. Pam and Greg Smart were newlyweds. He was an insurance salesman, and she was director of media services at Wincunnet High School. Pamela was a fresh 21-year-old. She described her life as picture perfect, but it really wasn't. I wasn't intending to have any relationship outside of my marriage at all, and my husband had an affair. Pamela began an affair with one of the high school students. Billy Flynn was 16. On May 1st, 1990, Gregory Smart was shot and killed in the doorway of their condo. Billy Flynn and two of his buddies were arrested. He committed the crime, but he said his lover, Pamela Smart, told him to do it. On August 1st, 1990, Pamela Smart was arrested. The Smart trial was a national sensation. It was the first trial to be broadcast live, and it starred, as the media labeled her, the Ice Princess, a calculating femme fatale who wanted her husband's life insurance. Ultimately, Smart was found guilty and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, a decision even some of Smart's toughest critics have called harsh. A major media circus, gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, and a courthouse pack. It was a small town crime that took on almost epic proportions. A murder scripted for Hollywood, a trial made for television. And in the glare of the international spotlight stood Greg's widow, Pam. Media coverage, however tacky, is inherently prejudicial. It's the classic tale of the seductress who seduces these young boys. National news is gigantic. The trial had higher ratings than the after. It was the first trial in history. Televised gavel to gavel. We were guinea pigs. I want to tell a great story. And I get so into the story that I really do forget what actually happened. Everyone concerned with Pamela Smart's trial was caught up in a black hole of media attention. The center of the media's fascination. Everyone was screaming, how come no one's doing anything? The very first person to endure a criminal trial gavel to gavel on live television. The 16-year-old confidant, nay, she wore a, a wireless mic, a hidden microphone. Pamela told this 16-year-old girl many incriminating things. Did you hear the tape, Mr. Spencer? The attorney general... Did you hear it? No, of course not. And I you've didn't. made a judgment on my daughter based I... on not hearing that tape? In this case, I've managed to tell everybody everything about this case before it even goes to trial. WMUR in New Hampshire produced a movie called The Anatomy of a Murder. And that movie detailed what William Spencer thought resulting in the murder of Gregory Smart. This was broadcast two days before the jurors were selected. You think she got a fair trial? No. She's been tried in the press. Do you feel that there is real evidence linking Pamela Smart to the murder of her husband? I think the real evidence is astronomical. You know what it is like to bury your own son? I, I think Pam's big problem was that the public was so morally outraged by the relationship she had that they focused on the sin and not the crime. And I think she was punished for the sin and not the crime. All of this will be documented at some point in a movie of the week. It's enough to make you wonder at times just what it's all about justice or just entertainment. How do tapes that are not authenticated and a transcript that's not authenticated ever be admitted for consideration from the jury? I mean, that's sort of the bedrock of the whole process, is if you're going to use a transcript, 
it's got to be authenticated as being accurate. Things happened in this trial that ultimately were either deemed waived in the courts or the judges, as a matter of discretion, were allowed to uh, let the evidence stand. Now, the problem with the tapes is ultimately they're edited. And ultimately, you're rewriting the narrative um, that happened in real time. And when you do that, you change the way another person understands that perspective. Um, and it certainly hurt Pam, this, you know, that, that change. It's really remarkable, though, because there is, just so you guys know, when you watch the movie, take a look as you listen to the tapes and you'll see the lawyer, the prosecutor, putting up a transcript of those tapes. And I have to say, I can't believe he got away with it because they are such poor quality, they are edited, um, and the transcript doesn't necessarily match what you're hearing. I mean, that there, it, it, the, the back and forth is somewhat off in some but cases. But they're very effective. They are. And there's tools that lawyers use that are effective and are manipulative, and that's their storytelling tool. The two tapes that never made it into the court hearing, that the jury never heard and never were made aware of, you completely denied any involvement whatsoever when asked on tape in front of many witnesses because I think at that point Cecilia Pierce and her mom and two or three detectives were sitting there listening in and in those two tapes you denied it. Yes, that's absolutely true. Those two tapes um, denying everything and of course the jury never heard that. Right. But neither one of them. They only played the two tapes that they thought were incriminating. The only person who had any kind of information that was giving me any kind of information about anything that happened in my house on May 1st was Cecilia Pierce. Okay. The police had completely shut down, and obviously now, looking backwards, that was because they had me as a suspect. But at the time, I was the widow. And I, that this was my husband who was murdered, and like any family member, um, and including his mom and dad, we were all calling the police every day, or speaking with the police every day to find out what was going on with the case. And what I found is that I, I couldn't get any information at all from them. And when I spoke to Cecilia Pierce, she was the only one that seemed to have the least details about it. The fact that there was a knife used. Um, on the night of the murder, that the knife was dropped on, and along with other items on the way outside of our condos, which proved which way um, the person or people who were responsible at the time exited the condo. Um, the fact that there was supposed to have been a previous attempts on Greg's life, those were all things that I got through conversation with Cecilia Pierce. Where did she get this information? Well, apparently, that's what I wanted to know, because apparently she got it from the principal people involved in the case. And why she had so much knowledge and where she got it from was important to me. But mainly, I really wanted to know, was, was this true? Is this really what happened? Did Bill Flynn really do this? I was desperate at the time for any information, because really what I wanted was for somebody to tell me that this wasn't how it happened. But she was the only one that seemed to have any information. And as I was trying to put these pieces together, her being my only source, I literally went to um, Greg's best friend, Brian Washburn, at the time, and told him that I felt that I felt like she knew more than she was saying. And the only way that I could get any information from her was just allowing by allowing her to talk. Obviously, I couldn't go in there with a list of questions and like I was having a police interrogation, right. but I felt like if I kind of, you know, made it like I, I knew, you know, something was going on and maybe she would kind of open up to me and that's exactly what happened. See, a lot of things that the transcriber wrote down in the transcript that Pam said were actually said by Cecilia. The judge uh, simply accepted the transcription as they existed. It wasn't until many years later, in 1995, that the tapes were sent to an expert in tape analysis, and he concluded that there were a lot of anomalies in the tape, unexplained starts and stops. Pamela gave us a copy of the report. I know that the tapes were tampered with. I know they were. If it were established, for instance, 
that there were incredible glaring defects that uh, into the integrity of the trial, I would think that would have some impact on a governor reviewing it for the relief you're seeking. There is a moment and where we find out that there was one of the jurors in the trial who was recording her perceptions of the trial every night on an audio recorder. Bill Flynn, he has like this really baby face, innocent looking, sweet as pie. I mean, he's the mastermind of this whole thing. I mean, he's the actual trigger man. He even pulled some tears in court. Huh? Our jurors all the time will get interviewed after the fact by media personnel such as yourself. You after could accuse the them of doing that there for that go. reason. That's it. Yeah, well, this you was after, after the, the okay. uh, No, no, no. Her tapes were made during the course of the jury. This was made during the trial, right? Her tapes? But she, had, but she didn't try to. She never tried to. She never disclosed she had the tapes until no, 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 she no, casually but, but mentioned it to somebody. But, but if, but if she's making these tapes during the trial in her mind, and I don't know that she is, but I'm telling you, but if she's making tapes during the trial as she's sitting on a, on a jury for a murder case with the intent later, I think I'm going to sell these and I want to have, the, I want to make them now, then that to me poisons okay. the jury panel. If, I'm not saying, I'm saying that's what I'm trying to probe. that two days before this trial started, the television, um, a local TV news station aired a whole piece about the trial right before they, the jury came in to, for, uh, uh, you know, for jury duty and to undergo voir dire where they're questioned about whether or not they have any kind of prejudice. And my curiosity is, and I got this from the film, but I'm curious, I mean, I'm curious if this is what you meant me to get, but it, it seemed to me that the judge right away set the stage for an unfair trial by allowing this kind of um, media event right before jury selection. It was unusual to me that the trial wasn't postponed. So do you think that the judge um, already had set the stage for this trial to not be fair and had tainted the jury, that this media coverage had tainted the jury pool before they even put their seat, their behind in the seat? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and in this case, the jury was not sequestered? No. Uh, which is a huge shocker. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would never happen again. So I do think that, and they didn't move the trial no. either. Uh, and so I think that uh, Pam Smart has an argument. Well, once upon a time, Productions, as I have here, is a life story option and purchase agreement. Cecilia Pierce signed this contract for a movie deal and sells her story. This is dated September 14th, 1990. And again, right here, purchase price of $100,000. Cecilia Pierce was wired for murder. She said that she was in love with Bill and she had a choice. She could either divorce Greg or kill him. She's so perfect. If you were doing this movie now, you'd just cast her. I said, um, God forgive me. Were you looking for a revolver? Were you looking for a 45? What are you looking for? Something 45. Why? Why? As a clip. Why? What's the difference to you? To me? Yeah. Lighter gun, smaller gun usually. How do you know all that stuff? I've read magazines about guns. If he knew what he says he knows about firearms from reading, he'd know that a 45 revolver is not light. So if he's referring to a 45 semi automatic, it has a magazine, not a clip. So he's pretty confused in what he's stating he knows from reading, which makes me think it's just BS. Now he can't help himself. The moment he starts answering the question, he's got a little smirk comes up and he starts shaking his head and the eye blocks. All right, so we've got a smirk there, we've got an extended eye block and we've got a head shake. So if you combine all three of those elements, as far as his non-verbals are concerned, what you have here is someone talking out of their backside. 
um, these young men, Billy Flynn um, and his accomplices, were housed in the same cell block in open cells. And so they were able to get their stories to be exact. Um, and that came out during trial. Uh, whether or not they um, had those stories prior to, um, to when they were arraigned, or that they maybe those stories began before they were arraigned, and then you know they perfected them in prison. It's hard to know, but during a trial, you would hope that they were housed separately, so you could get somewhere closer to the truth um, and have less of a rehearsed. Narrative. It's also the procedure generally that if if people are going on trial together, that you don't house them together so they can get all their stories straight. And in fact, there was one of the um, uh, defendants who was actually housed in a different area whose story wasn't consistent with the other boys. At a hearing in March, Flynn was granted parole. According to the parole board, Flynn has earned his college degree and has been a model inmate. He now plans to live in Maine with his wife, who he married while in prison. Patrick Randall was also released today in Manchester. Randall, who police say held Greg Smart down while Flynn shot him in the head, was released from the minimum security Calumet House on Lowell Street in Manchester. Pamela Smart, on the other hand, has been condemned and punished for her failure to admit any role in the murder. Life without parole is supposed to be a judgment that says this person is beyond hope, beyond redemption, beyond rehabilitation, has been given opportunities to change and hasn't changed and therefore should be properly condemned for their commitment to criminality, to violence, to destruction. Did you ask the student and his friends to kill your husband? No, I did not. I didn't ask him to kill my husband. I didn't want him to kill my husband. No. Is it possible even unintentionally that he got the wrong message from you and that was enough to inspire him to it, kill your husband? It's possible that that happened. You know, obviously I've thought about this for years. I know that what I did say to him when I ended the relationship was that I want to be with my husband. And it's possible that in, in his mind that he turned that into, you know, if he wasn't here, then that means you know, my husband, then that means that I would be available to Bill I don't know, you know, that there's, there's a possibility that that was misconstrued. Why do you think the student, Bill Flynn, and the others say you drove them to do this? Oh, because they don't want to be in prison for the rest of their lives. So they're that was you the as deal. the fall guy. That was the deal. That was the deal. They committed a first degree cold-blooded murder. They, would, they, they actually could have faced the death penalty in New Hampshire. Do you feel the student, Bill Flynn, is responsible putting you here. Yes, he is. Absolutely. You've said that even though you didn't pull the trigger, your bad choices essentially loaded the gun. Right. How so? Because I feel like that I know that if I didn't have a relationship with Bill Flynn, my husband would still be alive. And I feel like I knew better. I knew that what, what it was wrong, and I did it anyways. And I, I really feel a sense of responsibility for the fact that he's no longer here. Smart has filed numerous appeals and has lost every one of them. Now approaching midlife, she told me it's difficult to remain hopeful that she'll ever leave prison alive. I fear getting old in here and um, you know, having to deal with the stresses inside here as an older person, dying in here alone. For me, I, I, would, I would rather have the death penalty than have this sentence, because I'd rather just have an end. This whole idea of no end is just sometimes too much to bear. For Smart, life behind bars has been far from easy. In 1996, she was severely beaten by two fellow inmates, requiring a metal plate to be inserted into the left side of her face. The hate is, makes me cry a lot, still. Pamela Smart knows yeah. the hate she's felt from the public since her 1991 conviction for conspiracy to murder her husband, Greg, has never really weakened. Do you see where people over time think, why doesn't she show any remorse? 
I have remorse. I have a lot of remorse for the things that I did do, but I cannot have remorse for something that I didn't do. It is the hugest regret in my life. You know, I know that if I never had this relationship, Greg would probably still be alive, and he deserves to be alive. He was a great person. And I used very poor judgment. A New Hampshire jury found her guilty, but she insists she never told her teen lover to kill her husband in their dairy condo. They went into my condo, they put my husband on his knees, and, and they killed him while he begged for his life. And I wasn't there for that. They did that. So you think if your trial happened today, it'd be way different? It would be totally different. Smart says perhaps with a different outcome. I said, uh, God forgive me. During the trial, Flynn admitted to shooting Smart's husband that day in 1990. Now he's out of prison on a work release program. But for Smart, there is no work release, no chance for parole. It just seems so unfair, especially due to the fact that the people that killed my husband are out. I'm not asking to re for them to release me. I'm asking them to give me a parole date. Smart knows that may ultimately be a battle with no end, but she hopes the same media she believes played a part in convicting her will help set her free. Helping her through the dark days of prison, as she calls them, are her studies. Since entering prison, Smart has completed two master's degrees, one in law and one in English she literature. She spends her days tutoring, is spiritual, and wants people to know she's not the Pam Smart many think she is. I think that people have misjudged me. And I would, if I could speak to them, I would, I would ask them to try to take a second look at the entire circumstances of this case and to search within themselves to ask whether they believe this is fair. It's time to take a look at when enough is enough. And I'm asking just for a fair chance at that. I can only be who I am today. And the person who made that, those choices 20 years ago is not who's sitting here right now.